God therefore made not only the wrath of man, but also the cunning craftiness of cardinals to praise him. Sadly, didn't get Rome back into Geneva. His letter was used by God to get Calvin back into Geneva. That was the first factor. The second issue in Calvin's return to Geneva was the lack of cohesion in the city and the internal disturbances which arose with him gone. The little republic is now demoralized, factionalized, on the brink of ruin. And the party, if they may be so called, which was in government, which was anti-Calvin, made a number of serious blunders that takes them from power and the Roman Catholic party which had hoped to fill the religious vacuum saw their desires thwarted with Calvin's reply sadly that only left the third party the group favorable to Calvin they received more seats on the city councils through the elections and bit by bit as time went on, most people in Geneva came to agree, we need Calvin back. There's no one else to lead the church in the ways of God and to bring order to our city once again. So off go several high-powered delegations in turn and letters to Calvin in Strasbourg. This of course creates a dilemma. Because the government in Strasbourg and the ministers there reckon that Calvin is indispensable to Strasbourg. They argue that Strasbourg is the chief city in the French-speaking reformed world. And here is Calvin in our city attracting students from France and Germany and Italy who in turn are to return to their countries as evangelists. So there is a little battle with both Geneva and Strasbourg contending for the services of him who is called the theologian. And at the time this created a stir amongst the whole Protestant community in France and Switzerland and Germany and Italy. They were all greatly interested in this issue. Where is Calvin to go? We would say, is he going to accept the call from Strasbourg? To Geneva. In time, most came to see that the fate of Geneva depended on Calvin and the fate of France and Italy depended on Geneva. Most came to see that, I say, apart from Calvin himself. He is undecided. Undecided largely because he views returning to Geneva the scene of so much bitter opposition and distress for him formerly, he views that return with horror. Quote, Rather would I submit to death a hundred times than to that cross on which I had to perish daily a thousand times over. The way I was treated there, to go back to that Finally, Martin Bucer, the reformer of Strasbourg, persuaded Calvin. He reminds him of Jonah. Jonah was called by God to go to Nineveh. Jonah sinfully disobeyed and went to Tarshish. And God prepared a great fish to swallow him up and vomit him forth on the beach. Is that what it's going to take for you, Calvin? You must go to Geneva. The first time Calvin was persuaded to go to Geneva, it had been threats and imprecations from Farrell. This time, Bucer especially is prominent in persuading the reformer from New York, and Calvin acquiesces. He returns to Geneva on the 13th of September, 1541, and very unlike his first entry into Geneva as a refugee making a long detour to the south, unlike his first 
entry to Geneva five years ago. This time Calvin comes with an official escort and a wagon for himself and Italette. Strasbourg, however, has only agreed to lend Calvin to Geneva for six months, but he was to remain there the rest of his life. The rest of his life being 1541 to his death in 1564. Established once again in Geneva, Calvin sees as his priority the drafting and establishment of what was called the Church's Ecclesiastical Ordinances, penned in 1541. We need to get this church on a sound foundation. We need to have ordinances for proper government here. He was right. These ecclesiastical ordinances especially required four reforms. It's very interesting what these four reforms are. Number one, the proper exercise of church discipline. You can't have a good, solid church without that. And that, of course, was the original occasion for his expulsion. Secondly, the formulation of marriage ordinances. The marriage ordinances in the city were a mess. We unwieldy legislation, sometimes contradictory. It wasn't clear if someone was married or not. So that needs to be sorted out. And then thirdly, the catechetical instruction of the church. How are you possibly going to have a good church without catechetical instruction of the children by the minister? Calvin writes, It has ever been the practice of the church, and one carefully attended to, to see that children should be duly instructed in the Christian religion. It was a received public custom and practice to question children in the churches on each of the heads of doctrine which should be common and well known to all Christians. To secure this being done in order, there was written out a formula which was called a catechism. And the devil entered into the church and destroyed catechism instruction of children. And so Calvin concludes, what we now bring forward, this is the introduction to his catechism, what we now bring forward therefore is nothing else than the use of things which from ancient times were observed by Christians and the true worshippers of God, and which never were laid aside until the church was wholly corrupted. What a mess we're in now. Catechism instruction of the church, says Calvin, was never laid aside in church history until the church was wholly corrupted. What a mess we're in today. And no wonder so many children leave the church. The fourth major reform, not only marriage now, catechetical instruction of children and church discipline. The fourth major reform is congregational psalm singing. We need that. If we're going to have a properly organized reformed church, we need the congregation singing the psalms. I quote from Calvin's preface to the 1543 French Psalter. What St. Augustine said is true, that one can sing nothing worthy of God save what he has received from him. Wherefore, though we look far and wide, we will find no better songs, nor songs more suitable to that purpose than the Psalms of David, which the Holy Spirit made and imparted to him. Thus singing them, we may be sure that our words come from God, just as if he were to sing in us for his own exaltation. Believing this, Calvin labored with other helpers in producing a whole Psalter in meter in French. I said earlier that in 1539 in Strasbourg the Psalter consisted of 19 Psalms. Calvin never rested until 1562 when all 150 Psalms were set to meter to be sung in French by the church. That must have been a very happy day for the French reformer. <clears throat>